Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for coming. It's, it's nice to see so many guests for, for this event. Um, my name is James Rizzo. I represent Stiftung Mercator here in, uh, in Turkey. Um, our office is just uh, two floors above, so uh, it's very much a home play here. Um, maybe just a couple of words about, uh, about us, Stiftung Mercator. We are a private uh, German foundation established in uh, 96. Um, our Turkey work um, basically started around the, the years 2005-2006 when the uh, accession negotiations were kicked off uh, with the EU. Um, the foundation is named after if the famous cartographer uh, Gerhard Mercator who was uh, based in the region where nowadays um, the headquarters of the foundation are which is um, Essen fairly close to Düsseldorf. Um, the foundation's work is, is divided into four clusters. Uh, so one is cultural education, uh, the other one is integration, um, the, the third one is Europe, where also the Turkey portfolio is mainly based, and then uh, the fourth one, uh, and that's probably the most important for today, is climate change. Um, so, as I said, um, our Turkey work goes back to 2006. Um, our office here was only registered in 2015 and then officially opened in 2016. Um, and our Turkey portfolio mainly takes place, or a big chunk of it takes place within the, um, our joint initiative with the Sabanjo Sabanj University and the Istanbul Policy Center that was um, launched in, in 2011 and the uh, activities were then kicked off in 2012. Um, we strongly believe that um, it is essential for our foundation to, to better understand Turkey, not only for our foundation, but in general for Europe, to better understand Turkey and vice versa. Um, to arrange encounters with Turkish society and Turkish academia, uh, and to jointly search for a solution to, to the key question, the many key questions and challenges that we, that we have. Um, and in order to generate a better understanding, uh, we strongly believe in evidence-based dialogue. Um, and this, is, this being said, um, with Bruegel, we have now for the second round uh, supported um, uh, the, the, uh, the Turkey window of the energy and climate change dialogues. Um, and I, I don't think there could be any better partner for this, um, given Bruegel's very high standing in, uh, in academia and in, in the think tank world. Um, so, I'm very pleased to see uh, so many of you today and also to have uh, very distinguished speakers today. Um, and I, I don't think I should steal more of your time and I would invite uh, Pelin Oz from the Istanbul Policy Center. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a bit short. Uh, we are very delighted to have you here today with us. I'm Peli Noz. I'm from uh, IPC uh, Istanbul Policy Center. I'm the coordinator of Mercator IPC Fellowship Program. Uh, and this event is organized by Bruegel in collaboration with IPC and with the support of uh, Stiftung Mercator. Um, we live in a, a crisis-ridden globalized world and uh, we have global challenges that we have to tackle together like uh, terrorism, migration, climate change. And uh, we have to enhance collaboration, cooperation. And upon the building on these ideas, the initiative was created that James was talking about. The initiative was an, uh, org organization, a collaboration between IPC, Sabanji University, and uh, Stiftung Markator in Germany. And this has started uh, seven years ago the initial idea being that Turkey is a part of Europe and we have to come together, try to solve our common problems by exchanging ideas, by exchanging people. Therefore, within this initiative, we have this Mercator IPC Fellowship Program as a cornerstone of that initiative. And uh, over the course of the seven years, we have hosted 
uh, 44 fellows and 13 senior fellows who worked on many different issues. Mainly two themes were um, their working our areas. One of them is Turkey-EU-German relations and the other one is climate change. And we have every year working, uh, we have fellows working on climate change, mainly two fellows working on climate change every year. And they work in close cooperation with uh, the Climate Studies Cluster, which is a part of IPC, which is also coordinated by Mitshain, who's going to be the chair today. Uh, so we are giving much priority uh, to these uh, important issues like climate change and EU-Turkey-German relations. And also, uh, we have an addition uh, to all of these climate-related uh, centers, the clusters. We have another cluster within IPC, which is Shura. Uh, energy Transition Center. Uh, it deals with low carbon energy systems, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. So, uh, this event, uh, having this event hosting, uh, hosted in IPC is, uh, is a big delight for us. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and I'd like to welcome uh, Gustav Fredriksen for uh, his speech and starting the panel. Thank you very much. So, maybe I should turn this on. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Very good. Uh, thank you, James and Pellin, for those uh, introductory words. Uh, and thank you for having us here. Uh, it's fantastic being here in, uh, in Istanbul. Uh, and it's a great opportunity uh, to present this paper um, that I myself wrote, so my name is Gustav Fredriksen, um, that I wrote together with uh, two former colleagues of mine, Simone Taglia Pietra and Georg Zachmann. And uh, we finished this paper at the end of last year, so a couple months ago, uh, and we wrote it together while working at uh, Bruegel. I don't work there anymore, uh, but both Simone and Georg do. So for those of you that don't know Bruegel, uh, it's a think tank uh, based in Brussels and it specializes in economic policy. So, this paper is titled Estimating the Cost of Capital for Wind Energy Investments in Turkey. And the idea behind this paper uh, is really rooted in uh, Turkey's energy strategy. So, by 2023, uh, Turkey has a target of 20 gigawatt of installed wind power capacity. And promoting wind power investment will be crucial um, to realize uh, this target, but also to contribute to realizing the, the overall energy strategy. Now, more wind power would give Turkey several benefits. Um, it would enable Turkey to meet its rapidly growing energy demand. It would reduce its uh, dependence on imports of energy, which account for a large share of its energy supply. Uh, and it would also contribute to decarbonizing the Turkish electricity sector. Uh, it doesn't just sound good, but at least in theory, it's, it's also technically feasible. Um, so it's estimated that Turkey has a capacity of 114 gigawatt of wind power. Um, currently, I know that at the end of 2017, it had around 7 gigawatt. So there's still a big gap as to what's technically feasible and what's currently produced. So I figured I would... Um, put these uh, words into graphs here to show you what I'm talking about. So the blue bars show energy consumption in Turkey. And as you can see, between 2006 and 2016, there's been a rapid increase. Um, the orange line shows the share of imports in energy consumption. So the share of energy that's not produced domestically, but rather imported. And as you can see, it hovers around 80% during this time period. So a lot of energy consumed in Turkey is actually imported. If we narrow our analysis down to the electricity sector, we see that electricity demand has also been growing. And by 2023, the Turkish Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources estimate that our demand will stand at 385 terawatt hours. And as you can see, there's quite a big jump between the, the level recorded in 2017 and the level that's predicted for 2023. 
So in this regard, uh, adding wind power would be very beneficial because it would allow Turkey to meet this growth in demand. Currently, wind power accounts for 6% of the electricity consumed in Turkey, while the two biggest sources are natural gas and coal. And if we look at the wind power profile over time, we see that in 2007, there was virtually no wind power in Turkey. But fast forward 10 years, and that number stands at around 7 gigawatt. So there's been a, a pretty impressive increase in the amount of capacity that's been installed over the, over the past decade. Uh, but as I mentioned, to meet the 2023 target, more wind power will have to be added. So Turkey's 2023 energy strategy is broader than just wind power. Uh, it consists of four central elements. Uh, one is strengthening the security of supply. Uh, second, giving due consideration to environmental concerns in the energy sector. Uh, there's also an emphasis on increasing efficiency and productivity, as well as promoting R&D in energy technologies. And to realize these aims and to meet the aforementioned 2023 target for wind power capacity, uh, attracting and retaining investment in the wind power sector will be very important. So in order to figure out how to do this, there's a need to understand how the investment climate looks like right now in the Turkish wind power sector. And this is really the, the aim of this paper. Um, and we do this by both looking at the investment risk, but also, uh, and in addition, the, the renewable energy support that currently exists. So our study has two aims. The first one being estimating the cost of capital for wind power projects. Now, the cost of capital is a crucial determinant of the overall cost of a wind power plant. Um, the biggest cost in the whole project is related to building the plant. And to build a wind power plant, they're very expensive, so you need to find the money somehow. Um, so you incur financing costs, because you can either um, borrow money or you can issue equity. Um, both come out of financing cost. And once the power plant is built, you know, producing electricity from it is, is very cheap. It's virtually free. So the biggest bulk of the costs are incurred up front. Um, so this means that if you have a high cost of capital, it becomes very expensive to build uh, more wind power plants. So this can deter investment. So figuring out how high the cost of capital is, is really, really gives you a sense of how expensive it is to, to add capacity. And the second aim of the study is to, to look at the total cost of YECTEM, which is the renewable energy support scheme in Turkey. And there's, in the past couple of years, there's been high inflation and depreciation of the Turkish lira, which has increased the cost of YECTEM. Um, so we need to take this into account when assessing the overall investment climate for wind power producers in, in Turkey. So I'll briefly go through the literature. Uh, I won't bore you too much, but essentially the, the role of the cost of capital for wind power investment is widely recognized. It's a crucial determinant of the overall cost. And I want to point you to two studies in particular that have looked at, the, at estimating the cost of capital for individual countries in Europe. Uh, the first one being this DIACOR 2016 study, which was financed by the European Union. And it essentially estimated the cost of capital for all EU member states uh, for wind power. And it found a range of 3.5% to 12%. ECOFIS then replicated this study for southeastern EU member states and found a range of 5% to 13.7%. Now, a few studies have tried to do this for Turkey. The closest one, the closest study to, to our own is probably Ertürk, which, uh, who published his paper in 2012. And he found a cost of capital for onshore wind of around 9% in Turkey. But as I will explain in a couple slides, uh, our methodology is a bit different from his. So it's not a one-for-one -one replication of his study that we've done. So there are two renewable support schemes in Turkey, Yektem and Yekka. Uh, Yektem essentially guarantees a feed-in tariff uh, to renewable producers uh, for the first 10 years. And during the first five years, producers can also benefit from a local bonus. And this bonus is allocated to producers that, um, that have plant components that are produced domestically. And producers must apply for this uh, support scheme prior to 2020. 
The second scheme is Yekka, uh, which was introduced very recently. Uh, it essentially offers a renewable energy resource zone and electrical connection capacity uh, to firms investing in local R&D that use local labor or domestic labor as well as domestic equipment. So while writing the study, we ran into a couple of challenges when it came to the methodology. So traditionally, the way you estimate the cost of capital is you estimate the cost of equity, you estimate the cost of debt, and then you take a weighted average of the two costs. The problem with this methodology is that it's very difficult in estimating the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Uh, often you don't have the necessary data to do this, uh, and this is why a lot of studies that have used this methodology have sought to validate their estimates in interviews with stakeholders. So they come up with an estimate on their own, and then they go and ask uh, people actually working in the wind power sector, do you think this is a, a reasonable estimate? And we wanted to steer clear from this methodology because it's actually relying on self-reported estimates, which can you know, um, make the estimates a bit subjective. So instead, we take a, a more conservative approach by estimating the internal rate of return, which is essentially uh, the discount rate that sets the net present value of all cash flows to zero. So the internal rate of return, or the IRR, should be considered an upper bound for the cost of capital. If you have a, an IRR which exceeds the cost of capital, our project is making positive excess returns. Vice versa, it's making negative returns. So if we assume that the average wind producer in Turkey is actually making a positive return, we can take the IRR as an upper bound for the cost of capital. So to give you an example, if we find that the IRR is 10%, this means that the cost of capital is probably or should be at maximum 10%, so 10% or less. So we estimate the IRR by setting the net present value to zero of all the cash flows and then solving for the IRR. Um, and to calculate the cash flows, we need data on both the revenues and the costs. And we see that the revenues comprise the, the sale of electricity uh, by producers as well as the salvage value at the end of the period, which is the amount of money you get for selling your plant once it becomes obsolete. And in terms of cost, we have the investment cost, which you incur in the beginning, operations, maintenance costs, and taxes. Data, so there's a very nice data set from the Energy Market Regulatory Authority of Turkey that have plant-level data for all wind power plants covered by Yektem. So we have plant-level data on the feed-in tariff rates, production volumes, and production capacities. Now, we only look at projects under Yektem um, for two reasons. One, it covered 136 projects in 2017 that produced positive output. If you compare it to Yekka in 2017, Yekka covered one wind installation that we are aware of. So we have a lot more data if we use Yektem for analysis. It also supports wind projects of various scale. So not just big projects, but small and medium-sized projects. And this is good for our analysis because we want to deduce the, the average cost of capital for the wind power sector in Turkey as a whole. So the capital costs, unfortunately, we didn't have plant level data on this from, uh, from the database uh, from the Energy Market Regulator Regulatory Authority. So we had to estimate it somehow. And there's a very nice uh, data set published by MIDCEF on all the wind power plants that they've um, co-financed. And this includes 21 wind power plants. So what we did was that we took the plant level investment cost for these uh, 21 plants and then took an average. So we find an investment cost per megawatt of installed capacity. An OMM cost we take from a study done by IEA and NEA um, that also looked at Turkey. So these costs are for Turkey. So these are essentially the parameter values in our baseline scenario. The capital cost stands at around 1.4 million dollars per megawatt of installed wind power capacity. The average feed-in tariff rate in 2017 was around $77 per megawatt hour. And the market price, which is what producers receive after the first 10 years of operation, stands at around $45. And these are the results. So if you look at the very bottom, it shows the IRR from the calculations, and it stands at around 5.5%. So this suggests that the 
maximum cost of capital. So the upper bound for the cost of capital is 5.5% in Turkey. Now, what's striking about this figure is that it suggests that the cost of capital isn't higher in Turkey than it is in southeastern EU member states. We did a sensitivity analysis to test how reliable this estimate is. And unfortunately, you can't see the rightmost side. But if you look at the second last column, we see that the estimate doesn't change very much. It hovers between 4 and 7%, which is good. It uh, suggests that our, our, um, our result is reliable um, and robust to changing the parameter values. What you can't, you can't see, unfortunately, the full right column, but essentially this replaces the actual production values with the maximum production that each plant could, uh, could obtain. And we get higher estimates. On the other hand, they don't exceed 11%. So this is still in line with the idea that the riskiness of wind power projects doesn't seem to be higher in Turkey than in southern Europe. This graph shows the distribution of our estimates and broken down per plant. So we see that most plants had an IRR of between 4 and 7%. Some plants had negative IRRs, but the vast majority actually had positive IRRs. Now moving on to the um, cost of the Yekdem scheme. If you look at the orange line, it tells a pretty... Um, telling picture. It paints a pretty telling picture. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, you see that there's a massive increase in the um, compensation under Yekten to all the producers covered by the scheme. And the orange line is denominated in Turkish lira, whereas the blue line is denominated in US dollars. And you see that if we look at the cost of the Yekten scheme in the Turkish lira, it's increased by a lot from around 3 billion in 2014 to around 13 billion in 2017. And the corresponding increase in US dollar terms hasn't been as rapid. And if you look at the dark line, we see the share of fit compensation, so feed and tariff compensation that have gone to wind powers in the Ectem scheme. And it's, it's lain or it's lied um, between 10 and 15% during this time period. Now, on this note, we can also look at the, the share of compensation received by each technology versus the, the share in production of each technology. And we see that wind power produces around 30% of the power in Yektem and receives around 30% of the compensation. But if we look at geothermal and bioenergy, we actually see that these power sources receive a higher share of compensation relative to their share of production. So this brings me to my last slide. Uh, which, which are the conclusions. Uh, we essentially find an average cost of capital of around 5%, which suggests that the cost of capital in Turkey isn't higher than in southern Europe. Now, what we want um, to stress is that continued support for Yektem will be very important to make sure that Turkey attracts sufficient investment for it to meet its 2023 target. Now, the feed and tariff rate under Yektem is denominated in US dollars. So producers have still received the same amount of money for each megawatt hour produced. But electricity consumers pay for their electricity in Turkish lira, meaning that the cost of the, the increased cost of Yektem has been borne by electricity consumers. So going forward, it's important not to make any retrospective changes in the Yektem uh, feed and tariff rates because investors like certainty. So if, you realize, if they realize that the feed and tariff is going down, this might actually deter new investment in the sector. So maintaining the, the current renewable energy support for producers will be very important for Turkey to, um, to realize its 2023 energy strategy. Thank you very much.
questions and answers will be during the panel. After the panel. Okay. Thanks a lot, first of all, to Gustav for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And now we are uh, going to continue a discussion uh, about uh, the topic. So my name is Nick Chiavi. I'm the coordinator of climate change studies uh, in Stone Policy Center. Um, and uh, I tried to chair this panel. Uh, unfortunately, Simone, So the structure of this panel will be with our uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we will try to uh, discuss the more local uh, experiences uh, about the uh, issue. And in the beginning, we will have 10 minutes uh, presentations uh, from their sides. And then uh, we will have a Q&A session and discussion also uh, with your questions to So, first uh, speaker uh, is from uh, PSKB, uh, the manager of economic research department, John Hakiemas. I think he's going to make a presentation also, so you can take the uh, floor. Um, and I'll briefly introduce the panelists. So, John uh, Hakiemas graduated from Istanbul Technical University, civil engineering, uh, and then he uh, made his master's and PhD on economics. Uh, and uh, he started working as an energy consultant in Turkey in 2014, and uh, he's, he's been working in uh, his Sinai Kalkuma Bank as, uh, since May 2018 as the manager of economic research department. Please. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is John. Uh, I work for economic research department it's, uh, in T TSKB. Uh, since, 2000, uh, since May 2018, but I have a background in energy sector in Turkey uh, since 2014 as a consultant. Uh, before 2014, I worked for the Minister of Environment in Canada for seven years uh, as a macroeconomist and working closely with the energy experts over there. So I have a little bit uh, background in energy, so I'll uh, try to help you. Uh, explain what TSKB and wind energy uh, sectors and it's we want wind energy uh, today for about 10 minutes. Uh, TSKB is, uh, TSKB is uh, the first privately owned uh, development and investment bank in Turkey and then it was founded in 1950 after uh, the Marshall Aid program. Uh, since its foundation uh, Since its foundation in, uh, in, 2000, in 1950, uh, TSKB is, has been supporting Turkey's sustainable growth uh, with its deep knowledge and uh, experience, as well as the broad uh, array of corporate banking, investment banking, and consultancy services. Uh, TSKB has been providing uh, financial support to sustainable investment projects in many sectors as well as in wind energy. And uh, besides the financial models, TSKB also takes uh, environmental and uh, social risks into account uh, in all of its project evaluation processes uh, and constantly supports the country's transition to a low carbon economy and a more efficient production. Uh, 
uh, I mean, TSKB has a shareholder structure of uh, three, actually, in three uh, groups, and 51% owns by uh, each bank and 8% by Wakip Bank, and the remaining is free float. So we are a non-deposit taking institution, and the main uh, mission is to promote the development of Turkish economy by providing long-term facilities uh, for Turkish companies while enhancing the added value. Uh, so what, is this, uh, what does TSKB do in renewable energy? There, we have 287 projects we have uh, financed over the years hydroelectric power plants, wind power plants, and the other geothermal, solar, and biomass. And when we look at the amount, we have a total of uh, installed capacity of around six gigawatts of renewable energy projects. Four of them, four gigawatt is hydroelectric power plants, and 1.2, around 1.3 is uh, with wind energy power plants, actually. And we have geothermal, 12 geothermal power plants, and some biomass and some uh, solar power plants uh, financed over the years. When we look at this uh, map, we see what uh, the, the, the location of the projects which TSKB has financed over the years. And as you can see, uh, these red dots uh, belong to the wind power plants. And as you can see, these red dots are clustered in three regions, Marmara, Aegean, and South Anatolian, which are known to be the, uh, which are known to have higher uh, wind potential than uh, the other regions. So we are uh, need to have uh, more potential uh, wind power plants. We are financing the, the wind power plants with potential. And since 2013, uh, we have uh, diversified our uh, renewable energy portfolio. In 2013, we had 75% hydroelectric power plants. And uh, now, uh, by the end of the third quarter in 2018, we have 35% uh, hydropower plants. And how did we compensate this 40% decline? by uh, geothermal and especially wind energy projects. So when we look at the uh, share that we had in 2013, we had 18% in our portfolio as wind energy, and now we had 38% as wind energy projects. In our uh, portfolio, we had uh, 233 operational renewable energy projects, and this, uh, these projects amount to 5.2 uh, uh, gigawatts and 96% of these renewable energy projects are in the YECDAM mechanism. So they are uh, supported by the YECDAM mechanism as well. And wind portfolio, when we look at the wind portfolio, we started to finance wind energy projects in 2005. Between 2005 and 2009, uh, we only financed probably about uh, 100 gig, uh, megawatts. But after 2010, we had a pace and we we financed around 1,100, 1,165 megawatts. And it's around 1 billion USD dollars in total. Uh, and the average capacity factor for these 29 uh, wind energy projects that we financed is uh, about 32, about 33%. So what do we see? Uh, what do we see the issues of the wind energies in uh, wind energy power plants or wind energy investments in Turkey? So. As uh, Gustav mentioned, there are two schemes. One of them is YECNAM, and the other is the uh, newly proposed, or actually newly announced YECA project. YECNAM has been uh, in operation since 2005, and then it was supposed to be ending in 2015, and by the decision of the government, it's now uh, it's gonna be ending by the end of 2020. So after 2020, there is an uncertainty for wind power plants, so as again Gustav mentioned, investors don't like uh, uncertainty. So there will be a tendency to tend uh, to uh, not to invest after 2020 in the, circum in the current circumstances actually. And we have, uh, we see environmental problems such as implementing, implementing wind farms on uh, migratory routes of birds and we have noise emissions and its effect on people and animals, uh, which uh, could create shadow flicker problems, and inaccurate feasibility studies, which uh, end up with lower generation 
than expected. And with the uh, high inflation we have right now, the contribution fee, uh, fees are updated uh, with the consumer price index, so there will be a tendency to, high, to have higher operational expenses, even though it's a, it's a very small part of the investment in uh, wind energy projects. And uh, again, Yeka tenders, uh, there, are, there were three announced Yeka tenders in 2017 and 2018. One of them was completely, uh, successfully completed uh, in 2018. And uh, there were two of them, uh, two other were announced. One of them was offshore, which is postponed at the moment. The other is uh, for 1,000 megawatts onshore uh, Yeka. Uh, I think the, the last application date for the second Yeka is in March, and we will see what's going to happen because the solar Yeka was already postponed a week ago. And in the short term, wind energy investments, what will we expect in the energy investments? This is a graph where I had uh, combined the uh, market clearing price, the, the electricity market price, and uh, the feed-in tariff prices without the incentives of the local equipment. So since 2015, we, the market prices are way lower in terms of the foreign exchange, way lower than the uh, feed-in tariff prices, which gives a tendency for the investors to uh, finish their constructions or uh, which gives a tendency to pre-license owners to be quick so they can, be, they can finish their constructions or they can finish their investments by the end of 2020 to be included in the ECTAM. In the short term, that's where we, are, we may see a little bit uh, speedy uh, investments, but in the long term, since there's an uncertainty in the ECTAM mechanism and there are still uh, studies about it, uh, it might uh, have a, I mean, wind energy investments might have a difficulty after 2020. And uh, today I will be talking about this. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, ask. Thanks a lot. And, uh Uh, our next speaker, uh, Jana Nussoy, uh, uh, she is uh, the CEO, President and CEO of uh, GE Turkey. Uh, after she finished Istanbul University, she got her Master of Business Administration from Boğaziçi University. Uh, and after she worked for pharmaceutical uh, industry, then in March 2007, she joined General Electric and she's been appointed as president and CEO of G Turkey in August 2012. So, we have to Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Ümit Bey, wonderful to be here. And Gustav, uh, what a great paper. Something that is very much needed, not only by OEMs, but also investors in Turkey. I had a chance to also read the paper before I came here. So I prepared my uh, hopefully 10 minute speech in uh, three uh, headlines. I'm going to very briefly skip the first headline which is the, 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 the current status of the market and the trends but your presentation of the paper and uh, John Bay's presentation pretty much summarized where we are. There is a lot of room to grow and this room to grow is to the benefit of not only the, the government and the people, but also to the energy market players. I am a strong believer in uh, renewable energy and we have, as GE recently launched, our new platform which is called Cypress. It is a 5.5 megawatt single turbine with 158 meter blade diameter which really changes the definitions of levelized cost of electricity generation as well as AEP, which I hope will have a positive impact 
on the capital allocation in the projects. So there are a few things in the market in Turkey which make it complicated to invest more. Now I call them um, growth inhibitors. So the, the first one is bureaucracy in licensing, which probably you did not cover, but if you obtain a pre-license and if you want to start construction, you have to go to almost six different ministries and you have to obtain about 36 different permits after you obtain your license. And this is not, a, it's okay, you can have as many as 60 permits, but it is not very structured at the moment. And you don't know when you are going to have access to your project. So you invest up front in acquiring the license, in making the measurements, and then you continue on spending even before the project uh, financing lots of money on obtaining the licenses and preparing the documentation. And after that uncertain period of time, which is never less than two years, and it can go up to three, four, five years, then you go to a <coughs> bank and you apply for your project financing, which takes again, due to lots of bureaucracy, up to a year, two years to put your financing package together. So that long period um, adds a lot of uncertainty. The, the second growth inhibitor is the difficulty of understanding the market, especially for foreign direct investors. So what does an auction mean? What does a YECA mean? What does a feed and tariff project mean? Why don't all projects have feed and tariff? How do you get your local content booster? What happens if you don't? So it's, it's not an easy market operation to understand. And it's not very, or it's not as um, transparent as we would like it to be and structured as we would like it to be. There are lots of government bodies and also some NGOs working on making this better, but we still have room to go. And then coming towards the uh, financing and cost of capital uh, difficulties, one other growth inhibitor <coughs> is the local content challenge. Yes, having local content improves export-import balance of the budget and it makes renewable projects even more feasible for Turkey to adapt, but when you look at where liquidity is available and where the cost of liquidity is uh, more favorable, uh, ECAs um, are a very good source of financing for these projects as well as multilateral finance corporations. Um, but the more you increase and mandate local content, free flow of project money from rest of the world gets a little bit constrained. I believe there are other mechanisms of supporting the investors than local content boosters and that is one of the things that we need to look into more deeply, maybe another idea for another paper for you and the other esteemed uh, NGOs. And the last growth inhibitor, but not the least, is increased cost of financing. Turkey has gone through uh, a lot of security challenges, economic volatility, um, there is a lot of unrest in our uh, borders, which continues. There is a global uh, <coughs> lack of liquidity compared to previous years. You know, I can continue the negative list, but the cost of financing has increased. And even our local banks, like TSKB, which used to support um, renewable energy projects with favorable costs, right now due to challenges in the Turkish economy have an increased cost of landing. Um, so the, on one side, the investors in Turkey are challenged with catching the yekdem before the end of 2020. Then they don't know when they're going to really have the green light to go and invest. 
And then in the meantime, cost of borrowing has significantly increased. So last year, we saw one of the lowest years of adding to our installed capacity. I think only 600 megawatts of additions uh, were possible. There is, when I go around with my uh, global leaders of renewable energy, we see so many investors with so many beautiful projects, but when we sit down to make our annual budget, they ask me, how much are you going to sell? I cannot give an answer. It could be zero, it could be 2,000 megawatts. Um, but it's, this uncertainty is also not good for OEMs like us who also bring in investment and financing to support our investors. So, to sum up, most early project investors were able to invest in projects with a goal to recover their capital within seven to eight years, very good, but we are seeing this move towards above 10 years right now, as many of the remaining sites are with relatively lower wind resource, require high development cost, or have high royalty payments. At the same time, absent the recent market volatility, loan terms have increased and local banks were able to offer up to 14, 15 year door-to-door -door loans, almost matching ECAs, but we expect this trend to reverse due to all of the above costs that I have mentioned. So that's what I wanted to say about the cost of capital and uh, renewable energy projects. The second thing is the future of wind energy is very exciting. Let me give you a couple of highlights of what we are expecting in the near future, what is happening right now from a technology point of view, which is going to have a positive impact on these negative headwinds that I have mentioned. So we have seen a surge in both the advent and pickup of digital technologies, yet it is clear that there is still work to be done in that area across our region. And when I say region, I mean Eastern Europe, Russia, CIS countries, Middle East, North Africa, sort of like the 1.5 billion population within a four hour flight distance from, from Turkey. The turbines are getting bigger, faster, more complex. Digital technologies allow us to calculate site productivity better. Uh, coordinate different turbines to each other, have machines talking to each other, and with little iterations, with little optimizations in total on a wind farm of 50 megawatts and above, you can get up to 20% energy production efficiency. So that's one trend. We are having all kinds of digital solutions integrated into the turbine technology that will help people to recover their project investments back faster. Um, analytics, artificial intelligence at turbine level um, is one thing. The second thing is there is uh, a lot of investments being made into hybrid. Hybrid is in the sense when you say hybrid, different people understand different things. Um, hybrid means wind and solar plants combined, mostly, and also energy storage with wind, with solar, or with the combination. Um, and this improves not only the efficiency, but has many other side benefits which trickle down and at the bottom line have a positive impact on your cost of capital and your project IRS. One benefit is availability. The second is design optimization. The third is dispatchability, a huge impact on the way you optimize your grid. The fourth is flexibility and the fifth is affordability. Let me open up affordability. How does hybrid impact 
affordability, services operations performed at once for both plants, wind and solar, will enable lower uh, OPEX, uh, more efficiently using all available resources on a combined basis increases annual energy production at a lower capex than installing separate standalone solutions. In addition, you can optimize electrical engineering, which is substations, transformers, inverters, cabling, etc., and optimize civil works, approach roads, lighting, water and drainage systems. By co-locating wind and solar farms, the average energy production on the same grid interconnection point increases through complementary supply of wind and solar during different times of the day, improving the farm's overall capacity factor. All combined, this can result in a reduced capex through equipment and balance of plant optimization, thus decreasing the overall levelized cost of energy of the plant. Hybrid will eventually be the driving baseload solution for the whole region. As the industry starts to develop, there will be a clear development in countries who face particular issues like high grid connection cost, which is Turkey, need to optimize grid connection points, for example, like in Pakistan, and weak grid or high renewable penetration, like Morocco. Thank you very much. And as John, I'd love to take your questions <coughs> at the end of the panel, if you have any. Thank you. Third speaker is Mehmet Erdem Yashar. Uh, he is from European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He graduated from Koch University Economics and he did his uh, Masters of Economics in uh, LSC. And uh, he's been working for EBRD Islam Residential Office as an energy and infrastructure expert since 2010. Yes, sorry. Just a little introduction about myself as I try to open this. I've been with EBRD for about eight years now, so and EBRD has been operational in Turkey for roughly 10 years. So I've been through the whole story of EBRD in Turkey and um, having worked in the energy sector, I'll, I'll try to reflect on my experience, how we started and where we are now. And before going into the, the energy sector and the, and the wind investments, just a very quick introduction to EBRD for those of you who don't know EBRD. EBRD is a multilateral development bank established in 1991 and is um, currently operational in uh, 30 plus countries. And we, ha as shareholders, we have like, yeah, sorry. We have uh, 69 shareholders, 57% uh, owned by G7 countries, and 58% uh, shareholding is OECD countries plus China. So it's quite you know, international in its shareholding base, uh, but we uh, have EU countries as our you know, biggest shareholder, if you see on the right, and also EIB is a, is a shareholder in EBRD as well. So I'll skip this part. I mean, for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to share the full presentation after, after the panel. But I'll, I just want to focus on what we did in Turkey. So we, the EBRD started operations in Turkey actually in 2008. So the lending started in 2008, but the um, office was opened in 2009 in Istanbul. Currently, we have two offices, uh, one in <coughs> Istanbul and one in Ankara. Ankara is the... Um, liaison office in a way, uh, dealing with governmental issues. And we have a really large team in Istanbul, um, about 60, 65 people, and we have another 20 people in Ankara. And we cover almost all the sectors uh, uh, throughout, uh, through our office in Istanbul. Um, our annual investment volume 
for the last, I'd say, five, four to five years was roughly 1.5 billion euros on an annual basis. But as you would expect, because of all the macroeconomic uh, situations in 2018, we scaled back and uh, we end close 2018 with roughly 1 billion euro investment. The second bullet point where we talk about GET, GET is, um, is an EBRD terminology referring to green economy transition. So it is one of the key mandates of EBRD. And what it entails is uh, increasing the share of EBRD, uh, share of renewable and um, energy efficiency investments um, to almost half of total EBRD investments. In 2017, this share was 43%. And going forward, we have a target to further increase it. So EBRD is focused going forward um, in all its countries of operations will be green economy transition, renewable and energy efficiency. And we also do um, I mean equity investments. We have one equity investments in the energy sector, which is um, together with IFC, we invested in the Akfen renewables portfolio. So again, on the right, uh, to total number of projects to date, we financed 257 projects, total investment of about 10 billion euros, and our current um, operating assets, are, uh, let's say exposure to Turkey is roughly 7 billion euros. Focusing only on, <clears throat> um, yeah, these are number, it, this is just for 2018, roughly 35 percent, uh, 35 projects with uh, 800 million euros, but this is, this was the, the data from beginning of December and we closed this, we signed a couple of other deals uh, in December and closed the year with 1 billion euros. So on, uh, on the pie chart, uh, where we invested in, in the energy sector, so we tried to cover almost all the spectrum uh, primarily focusing on renewables, but we're also aware of the fact that, you know, we also need to um, help and support the distribution network. So we have financed quite a number of distribution companies because we believe, you know, that the network should be strengthened to, you know, ac uh, accommodate more renewables in the system. Uh, we have financed one CCGT, again, that was um, back in 2012 when, when we thought, you know, Turkey needs more base load power. To, to accommodate more renewables. Some, you know, case, case studies about our wind financing, uh, Rotor Wind Farm with Zorlu, which is 135 megawatts. This was the first uh, project that EBRD financed in Turkey together with uh, EIFC and EIB uh, back in 2009. And then uh, Bandirmares with Energisa, 143 megawatts. Uh, signed in 2013. Uh -huh. As you will see, we, we try, I mean, when it comes to our direct financing, we, we focus on sizable projects. So we have two approaches to financing uh, energy projects in Turkey. One is um, through local banks, where we provide them credit facilities with specified um, conditions to apply and to be directed towards financing renewable uh, projects. And this is the next slide. So we have two programs uh, with local banks. One is MITSEF, which Gustav referred to, and MITSEF is a uh, one billion plus facility across seven Turkish banks, each holding 100 to 200 million euros of financing. And these are primarily directed towards renewable uh, financing, MITSEF. I mean, it's small size, I mean, mid-size wind, biomass and geothermal plants. The TURSEF program is, is an energy efficiency program uh, again, with Turkish uh, commercial banks, uh, with five banks, I, as far as I know. So together with EBRD's direct financing, that's the first row, uh, EBRD's total financing to, to uh, Turkey's renewable and also energy efficiency projects uh, exceeds 2 billion euros as we speak. Going back to the growth inhibitors, and I mean, I'm, I really appreciate Jan Anand's summary of uh, what's going wrong, let's say, in the market. And I've attended you know, numerous panels, conferences, where we talked about scaling up renewables, scaling up wind energy, wind uh, investments, and it, it's always the same issues that come up. I mean, the regulation, the bureaucracy in licensing, the, the lack of visibility post-2020, and the local content. 
This is why, I mean, lately we've been focusing more on policy dialogue with the government, trying to address these issues. Uh, in 2013, to, uh, 2014, we started our, um, let's say, interaction engagement with the government to help them first design a strategy, the action plan for renewables going forward for Turkey. And the, all the you know, renewable targets, targets that you see uh, being announced by the government for 2023 are actually the outcome of the study we um, did for the government. And then uh, we also worked on the National uh, Energy Efficiency Action Plan, what the government should do to um, you know, support energy efficiency investments, especially in the public sector, because that's where we see a lot of investment is needed because most of the technology is outdated and there's a lot of you know, efficiency gains that could be achieved in the public sector. These are the details of the study we did on the National Renewable Energy Action Plan. I haven't included here, but two other studies that we are running with the government, uh, the Minister of Energy, is one, the licensing regulation, how to streamline the licensing. And we've been working with them for almost two years now. Uh, we have the final report and it will be hopefully announced uh, soon to the public. And we're focusing on a one-stop shop approach whereby there they should be one state entity dealing with the applications and then in the background managing the other stakeholders. So instead of the investor running around dealing with a number of different ministries, there should be one responsible body within the government or within the state to, to face the investor and deal with all the you know, back work, background work within the, the government itself. And try to reduce the licensing uh, to year and a half, because in Turkey it's now three, almost three years, sometimes four years. Mm -hmm. And not only for the investors, this is also a problem for the fin uh, financing parties, I mean, like banks uh, ourselves, because we end up in situations where we do all the, the let's say, feasibility studies, our dil due diligence, and uh, we just cannot get, I mean, the investor cannot get, like, the last uh, permit that, that's required to start the construction. Then you have to put everything on hold, wait for four months, five months, six months, then you have to go back and, you know, update your due diligence. Then it, then it prolongs the whole financing uh, process as well. And on another study that we are doing with the government is the support scheme post-2020. What should be the renewable energy support scheme be once the once YECDEM is over? Um, we have, again, submitted the final report to the, to the government, and we understand they are still debating uh, within the, the ministry to agree on the final scheme. But uh, as far as we understand, YECDEM will not be, let's say, uh, extended beyond 2020, mm -hmm. but um, the government is aware of the fact that there should be some sort of a support. I mean, if not a feed and tariff, there should be a floor mechanism to protect the investors from, uh, you know, market prices going, going down. Again, touching on what Jan Anam said on the, uh, if, if, I mean, foreign direct investors uh, not understanding the market, which is really the case, because I have issues explaining the market to my counterparts in London, I mean, our head office is in London, because there are a number of different schemes running in parallel. There's the YECA that the government is pushing forward, there's the YECTEM uh, scheme, the government auctioned uh, wind projects uh, on, a, on merchant prices, and, um, and YECA is not progressing as planned. There's the local content that the um, government is pushing for, but then the YECA, the manufacturing facilities are not being established. So these are all you know, uncertainties that have been introduced to the market in the last two, three years, and it's really difficult to, to see where the market is going. And this will probably <coughs> impact uh, the, the targets, because I think we stand at 7, 7, uh, 8, close to 8,000 8, megawatts in wind, and the target is 20,000 megawatts. Can we close that gap in the next four years? The government's approach is to close this gap through big tenders like YECA's 1,000 megawatt and uh, tender out five, uh, I mean, hold five tenders in the next two, three years, up to 5,000 <laughs> megawatts. But this is, you know, debatable given the uh, situation with the, uh, the first round of YECA. Uh, as I said, I'm happy to share the full presentation, but um, please, I mean, Please let me know if you have any questions about the, the presentation.
last speaker is Massimo De Femia. Uh, he is the head representative of the European Investment Bank in Turkey. So he holds degrees in law and uh, political sciences. He joined the European Investment Bank in 1993 and he was appointed to Western Balkans uh, and then to South Europe, uh, South Eastern Europe Department and he uh, in July 2013 he's been appointed as EIB Group Representative in Germany. Um, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ulit Bey. Uh, thanks especially for this kind invitation to participate uh, to this debate today. Uh, I'm really um, happy to be here because uh, I think we need more and more uh, this kind of uh, uh, open uh, uh, discussion on uh, what uh, we have achieved uh, in uh, crucial sectors uh, in Turkey and uh, what are the steps forward, uh, what are the constraints, the difficulties, um, sometimes uh, even the barriers that uh, are uh, uh, creating uh, uh, some delays in the implementation of uh, crucial sectors like um, uh, the energy sector in the country. Um, I will not do a classical presentation of what uh, EIB uh, is uh, uh, doing uh, in Turkey. You have, uh, um, you have a booklet that uh, has been distributed uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, conference, so you can find in uh, the booklet all uh, uh, the information related uh, in general to EIB and in particular to our activity in, uh, in Turkey. Um, on the contrary, I will try to uh, say a few words on uh, what is uh, our uh, mission for climate change, first of all. Um, on one hand, as a European Union uh, uh, financial institution, we have a, a clear mission on uh, climate change and some specific targets. Uh, then I will give you some uh, uh, examples of uh, what we have done in Turkey, in particular for uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and climate change in general. And finally, I have to develop with you uh, some considerations about the future. I think uh, I will keep this to the end because uh, we need in this occasion to uh, open a dialogue on what uh, will be the future for Turkey, especially in this key sector like uh, energy. So EIB is uh, uh, by far the largest uh, multi, uh, multilateral uh, provider of uh, climate, uh, uh, climate finance. Uh, and uh, especially after the <laughs> Paris Agreement, uh, we are coordinating a group of uh, multilateral development banks uh, because we want to develop common pr principles uh, to climate mitigation uh, uh, finance. Uh, and we are committed to integrate in our day-to-day -day work uh, the goals of uh, uh, Paris Agreement. Um, we have, as I said, a specific target. We have taken the period of uh, uh, 2016 to 2020, and uh, as EIB only, during this period, we have to invest 100 billion euro to climate change related projects. It's a very specific target. It is representing 25% of our total activity as a bank. Uh, so you see how important it is for us. And uh, uh, how uh, enormous are the resources that uh, we uh, are able to mobilize to achieve these targets. Uh, if we look at uh, the results of 2017, because unfortunately today our results 2018 are not yet available, um, we have uh, developed a general activity and our core business is in Europe. We do more than 90% of our core business in Europe. Um, we did about uh, a bit less than, than uh, um, 
78 billion euro. On a total of 78, um, about 20 billion has been invested in climate change. Uh, so uh, we are already uh, in 2017 and even more in 2018 uh, fulfilling the target of investing at least 25% of our activity in climate change related investments. Uh, then I would say uh, when we look out of the European Union, and I will come back discussing Turkey, this percentage of 25, it grows up to 35%. So uh, in order to show that uh, uh, outside European Union we are even more committed to develop these kind of projects. And 35% of a large lending activity is a lot of money. Um, then how this money is uh, invested? Uh, first of all, the most important uh, uh, recipient of these investments is um, uh, projects that are related to improve the quality of transportation and shifting from roads uh, to other transport modes, rail, uh, urban transport. Uh, there is a real effort on that. There are, of course, energy efficiency, renewable energies, uh, research and development, and a set of uh, measures that we call uh, adaptation to climate change. Uh, and on the side of the financial markets, we are also committed to develop what we call the green bonds. So it is not only a lending activity, but is also promoting in the financial market the utilization of green bonds as a, a, a resources, a fundamental resources to uh, collect this huge amount of money that we need to fulfill our targets. Uh, let me come now uh, to the second part of my uh, intervention to uh, say a few words uh, on, uh, on Turkey, on what we have done uh, um, since, uh, I would say, the last uh, five years. Um, we have provided to Turkey roughly one billion euro, 27 investments, uh, and unfortunately, at least looking back at uh, the last uh, five years, we have not yet reached the famous 25%. We are just uh, reaching about 14, 15%. That's not too much. But I will try to explain later what are the reasons. I think uh, the previous speakers, they have given already several explanations. So I will try to uh, also provide some uh, um, comments on that. Uh, then uh, uh, I would say uh, I would also like to give you some uh, uh, more specific examples. Uh, of course, a successful program has been already mentioned. is called MITSEF. We have done it uh, with EBRD, with the European Commission. So we try to put together uh, several resources, several institutions working around the table and providing to the market uh, the financing that these projects needs. Because it's long-term financing, it should be cheap than a comparable product. Uh, we have to give a certain incentive to the investors to take this risk. Because these are long-term projects. Um, but there is not just a uh, the MITSEF, uh, there is also um, there is also other programs uh, that are more, uh, uh, let's say, large and uh, uh, are uh, related to um, the long-term contribution to improve uh, climate change. Uh, one example is afforestation in the country, uh, erosion control. Uh, with the public authorities, uh, since 2010, we have developed a program of investments that is supporting afforestation. Uh, so, uh, long-term investments, more than 400 million euro, uh, contributing to this 
targets. And this is a, a long-term program. Uh, another similar program is uh, flood prevention. Uh, again, if negative effects of climate change on our, um, on our cities, on our villages. This is a long-term approach. Uh, and sometimes uh, governments in Europe, but also outside Europe, they don't have the resources and they don't think that this is useful. They look at the disaster that sometimes are created and they take some urgent measures after the disasters, but there is no um, prevention on uh, the effects of uh, uh, these natural uh, events. Uh, and then, of course, we have a, a very close cooperation with TSKB because uh, we have provided uh, a climate change facility to TSKB uh, in an intermediate way. So they get EIB financing and they use this EIB, fi EIB financing to provide support to small and medium-sized projects uh, in uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy. There are other banks, uh, I can mention uh, YAPI Credit, uh, Ish Bank uh, that were in the, last, uh, in the last years very uh, proactive uh, uh, supporting these kind of investments. Uh, obviously, uh, the development uh, of uh, these investments needs uh, stability, needs uh, a macroeconomic context uh, where uh, uh, you can uh, do some uh, financial forecast and convince investors to come in. Uh, in the last uh, uh, years, uh, Turkey has not uh, uh, given, unfortunately, uh, this uh, feeling and this, uh, and this image. Um, and uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, the uh, obstacle, the main obstacle we have in these days. Uh, because uh, if we look, for example, at the Turkish uh, electricity sector, uh, the electricity sector has uh, drawn about uh, uh, 95 billion dollars of investments. And uh, to do so, uh, these 95 billion dollars have uh, to be backed by 50 billion dollars uh, outstanding debt. And uh, of course, this is one of the most indebted sector of the country. Under the present macroeconomic situation, this is creating uh, huge imbalances also for the banking sector how much the cash flow has to be increased from these investments, uh, considering also the recent devaluation of the, of the Turkish lira, to fulfill and to repay this debt. These are major questions that uh, we should deal with. Uh, in order to make our programs for the future uh, in a more, uh, uh, let's say, pragmatic way, without uh, avoiding the difficulties or forgetting the obstacles. Let me come to the conclusion now, because I don't want to take too much of your time and your patience. I have seen, uh, and I'm really happy uh, of your uh, academic contribution uh, that you finalize also with uh, uh, Simone uh, Tagliapietra, and uh, in preparing uh, my notes for uh, uh, this discussion today, I also had the chance to read a paper that uh, Simone, unfortunately, is not with us today, has uh, written uh, recently. Uh, and I have seen that uh, in one of these papers, he was uh, uh, calling for a greater EIB involvement in the sector, especially in Turkey. That's much appreciated from him, I would say, because uh, uh, there is a need, and we have seen it, the, fig the figures, of uh, uh, additional investments uh, uh, in uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency in the country. Uh, and uh, 
a greater EIB uh, commitment, I'm sure, we would leverage additional financing. Um, I don't have to tell you that uh, every time, uh, also with other colleagues of uh, international financial institutions, we are participating to a project, we open the door uh, to other investors. So we facilitate the success of the financing. This is something we do, is part of our role. Uh, so we should do so, but what uh, I would uh, reply to this kind invitation that I got from uh, Simone is that uh, we should not forget that we have a controversial situation between European Union and Turkey. And uh, this controversial situation, in particular, several concerns that have been expressed about democracy, about rule of law, uh, put all this process on hold. And uh, the European financial support that is uh, targeting specifically also uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency will be reduced in the coming years. So we will lose also the part of the European Union grants that are uh, so crucial to uh, structure in a more incentive way these kind of investments. That unfortunately, but that's, let's say, the status of the art of the sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to all of our speakers for the very interesting um, uh, speeches and presentations. Before uh, going to opening the floor uh, to the audience, I'd like to uh, add some remarks very briefly, um, and I'd, especially after um, almost all speakers said, uh, especially Jan said that the, the investments about wind and renewable energy are going down. So I'd like to add some climate change alarmism to the flavors to this uh, yeah. panel, because uh, on the one side, the Turkey's um, renewable energy investments are going down. On the other side, as we know from a, a very recent uh, special report of IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so we have very limited time left to keep the global warming below uh, 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, which uh, was uh, already adopted as the main goal of Paris Agreement, and all countries, including Turkey, uh, accepted that we should keep global warming uh, below 1.5 degrees, or maximum 2 degrees, or well below 2 degrees, actually. And in order to uh, get this uh, objective, we need to uh, have net zero emissions in 2050 only 30 years from now. And if you want two degrees, uh, if you're okay with two degrees, it should be latest 2070, so in 50 years from now. Uh, but in order to make this happen, uh, you need to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions all over the world 50% until 2030, so almost 11 years. You have to help make, make it help the, all the greenhouse gas emissions. So. Um, it's very uh, ambitious uh, and we don't have any more time to lose actually for all these bureaucracy and, and everything to decarbonize uh, our economies worldwide, including Turkey. If you look at Turkey's <coughs> targets, Turkey's INDC, uh, Turkey's targets are compatible with four degrees, unfortunately. If means that if all countries uh, follows uh, all countries follow the way of Turkey, so uh, global warming of four degrees until the end of uh, this century is guaranteed. Um, on the other hand, yesterday uh, we heard from the Ministry of Energy uh, and Natural Resources that Turkey had a historical record of local coal production uh, this year, last year, uh, and. Turkey uh, produced one mil one, uh, I think, 
1 million and 1.5 million tons of local coal last year, so which was a historical record. Um, on the other hand, we are decreasing the investments on uh, renewable energy. If you look at Turkey's climate policy targets, um, Turkey is not planning any peak to its emissions until 2030. So my, uh, this was the things you all know. Uh, I want to add one thing to maybe uh, boost the discussion uh, on Turkey's official position on Paris Agreement because it's very much related to the renewable energy investments and especially the uh, investments from the multilateral uh, banks. Uh, as you know the, uh, about Turkey's uh, official position on Paris Agreement. Turkey has a very long uh, story uh, on the United, uh, international climate change regime. Uh, started in Rio 1993. Uh, you know, Turkey uh, became uh, a part of or listed in Annex 1. Uh, so Turkey is considered as a developed country uh, in the uh, international climate regime. And because of this categorization, uh, Turkey was very late to Kyoto Protocol. Uh, Turkey didn't get any target with, for the Kyoto Protocol. And also for the Paris Agreement, Turkey is not party yet because claiming that uh, if Turkey becomes a party to Paris Agreement as an Annex 1 country, um, Turkey will not uh, get any fund from uh, Green Climate Fund but also, uh, not only Green Climate Fund, but also all the other multilateral uh, renewable energy uh, funding. Uh, because Turkey's official position, uh, which was repeated s several times in all the COPs, all the climate conferences, that um, if we uh, ratify Paris Agreement, uh, without having any special uh, special circumstance or any uh, exceptions, exceptions uh, that Turkey will not get any money for the renewable energy and for all the climate finance uh, because it is considered as a developed country. So this, I, I just want to uh, put this to the discussion also because um, this is very important uh, also for the renewable energy investments of Turkey because it's very much related to the decarbonization pathway of Turkey. Um, if Turkey really wants to decarbonize its uh, economy, so it needs to uh, go together with the international climate uh, the politics. And if uh, Turkey is going to be only observer to the Paris Agreement uh, after this year, so it will be very difficult. So I'd like to ask also your opinions on this matter. But before, uh, I'd like to open the floor for the discussions and like to get some this, uh, some questions, few questions, and then get back to you. Okay. So we can have a few, uh, few questions from the floor, if you have any. Thank you. Uh, can you please compare solar to the wind? Sorry? Solar energy, photovoltaics, hmm. compared to the wind. Advantage and disadvantage, so, please. Uh, I just forgot to tell uh, that please introduce yourselves first. Okay. Sorry, sorry. My name is Kıvanç Görkem Üçler Topra. I am the chairman of Transpacific Energy. My question was comparing wind energy to photovoltaics with advantages and disadvantages, especially with environmental aspects. Okay, you, and you ask to everybody? So, Jalan Hanım, maybe. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, my name is Melissa Ruxoy. I'm a political science and sociology student from Bahçeşehir University. My question is also uh, asked to uh, Jana Nussoy about the issue of hybrid energy, which is the combination of solar and wind energy. Uh, I would like to thank to her about her emphasis on this issue because I'm, 
out of curiosity, uh, personally interested in solar energy because I believe that as the climate of Turkey, it is very um, productive for Turkey to consider solar energy as an alternative. So I would like to ask whether um, approximately how much uh, should be actually conserved from the budget of Turkish economy for hybrid energy? Like approximately, how much should be spent? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a side question actually. It's kind of about the main of the discussion. But about the criteria based on which Turkey has been chosen as a developed country in the Kyoto Protocol, which means that it has to export the know-how instead of import it. Hmm. Any other questions? I can collect a few more questions before going to the second tour. <coughs> Uh, considering the climate, I'm Ahmed Serkman, I'm working for a Spanish energy engineering company, um, <laughs> Natur Naturgy Engineering. Uh, my question is, uh, how, do you, how do you think the, the role of gas, uh, I mean, during this climate change, uh, in order to uh, meet the requirements of the Katowice and Paris Agreement and so on, how um, gas, I mean, Okay, coal, it's almost, it's not, for example, I'm, I'm, um, I am checking the situation of EBRD and IEB about the financing the coal um, power plants. Uh, I, I, I see that they are not, um, they are not willing to finance uh, coal, but, but the gas, it's, it's still, for example, full, full switch for the projects of the switching from the gas sorry, for, from fuel oil to gas or coal to gas, are still um, supported by EIB, uh, by EBRD. So, I mean, I want to know what is the role of gas during, during this, um, let's say, travel? Okay, thank you. Uh, I can have one more question. Also, if you can ask to Gustav about this presentation. My name is Olena Karakan, Koch University, and my question will be connected to with the legal point of climate change and especially with is connected with Turkey. Uh, about green injustice, is there, is there any program in Turkey um, concerning with uh, penalties, for example, with gas pollution, which we have from the cars? Um, maybe you have some ideas how to reform uh, this system, especially justice. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's start with Gustav, I guess. Gustav? Uh, there is perhaps another question. Hmm? There is another question. Yeah, we can make another tour for the no. questions. Yeah, before. We have a lot of time, so no, no, I, I think we can. We, we can don't have a lot of time. <laughs> really? I think we have 45 minutes. Really? I, I have an appointment at 12. I need to leave 11.30. 11.30? <laughs> hmm, 11 oh, yes. Okay. Because the, my program is going up to... It changed 30. and evolved. Right. In the beginning, they right. asked me one hour from 10 to 11. <laughs> okay. So. Um, okay, let's take uh, a few more questions. May I have a question to Gustav, uh, uh, to save time maybe? Uh, what is your... Ex, uh, expectation, uh, IR expectation for offshore projects. I think, uh, I, uh, I think that the data you have relied upon for this study is uh, rather uh, uh, among uh, the onshore uh, projects. What, what about the offshore projects? Okay, then we can have another question from you. No? I think you, you raised? Yes, I did. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Naomi Shirina, and I work at the Economics Department at the Dutch Consulate General here in Istanbul. And it's a bit a broader topic because I'm researching waste to energy in Istanbul and Turkey. And we don't usually talk about that when we talk about sustainable energy. It's mainly wind and solar. 
And I was just curious about your thoughts on waste as an energy source. Hmm? Okay. Okay. If you don't have any, so we can start with Gustav. Maybe you can also uh, react to the other speeches before, if you like. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, to respond to the question regarding offshore wind, uh, so you're right that this IRR applies to onshore wind. Um, I don't know the exact share of wind projects in Turkey that are onshore versus offshore, but I know that the vast majority is onshore. Um, so most of the projects that we looked at that are covered by Yektem are onshore. So this IRR estimate should be, um, should be viewed as as uh, pertaining to onshore wind. I know that AirTurk, so the study that I alluded to that was done in 2012, that came up with a, a WAC estimate of 9%, he also only looked at onshore wind. Uh, I don't know if it's due to a lack of projects on the offshore wind uh, side that one can produce reliable, reliable estimates for offshore wind as well, but our analysis limited uh, the scope to onshore wind, so I'm afraid I can't tell you what the IRR would be for, for offshore. Um, can I go on? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting remark I think that you made uh, regarding solar. Um, we thought initially about doing the analysis for solar in Turkey as well, um, but I showed you the generation mix in Turkey and there's only 1% of electricity that's currently produced from solar. So. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the analysis for solar because we only had, you know, three projects to base our analysis on. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to say what the corresponding estimate for solar would be. Uh, maybe in the, hopefully, in the future, if Turkey adds more solar capacity, one can do a similar analysis. And I know that your natural gas question was very related to EIB and EBRD. Uh, and I don't want to speculate as to why they're, why they're financing it. Uh, I mean, I guess it's advantageous. I mean, from the top of my head, I can think of two advantages. I mean, one, it is a dispatchable power source. So, you know, you can't only add renewable energy. Um, that's one interesting challenge that Turkey hopefully will face in the future as it keeps adding renewable capacity that you need some sort of balancing mechanism with dispatchable power sources as well. I guess, you know, natural gas is also cleaner than, than coal, uh, but I would be very interesting to hear your, your answers to this question as well. But uh, yeah, no, I thought it was a very interesting question actually. Thank you. Okay. So for the question about the comparison between solar and wind projects, um, solar projects today globally and in Turkey are very promising for the future but not uh, in but not as feasible as wind in the current state of technology there are um, three factors that make this one solar projects are land intense you need a big part of land and once you put the panels in you cannot reuse the land for farming or other agricultural activities. You basically kill that land. So that adds to the uh, capital cost. The second thing is the current inverter technology and GE has one of the best, but it is still very limited. The amount of electricity you can generate from the endless sun is very small, but your expense is high. And the third thing is any variation in climate and in uh, the, the solar capacity impacts the way you transmit energy to the grid, making it very unstable. In theory, if we have the right technology, um, half of the desert in the middle of Algeria is enough to power all of EU 28 countries. 
every single day. So the potential electricity from sun is great, but the way we can convert it today is limited. There are other, uh, other factors. The regulations of solar projects are now coming to um, a mature phase. Usually the first few years was all roofed up, less than one megawatt, small serial projects, which really didn't help the investors in Turkey to gain enough experience in understanding solar. The, the second question about hybrid, I think I am feeling more positive today. There is a lot of investment globally in making hybrid more um, sexy. And in Turkey, until recently, the regulation did not allow the investor to do two technologies under one license. License is given to a part of land, so they could do only one technology. But recently, the government with, I think, the 71st uh, Kararname, I don't know how to say Kararname in English, decree, uh, uh, maybe, yes, uh, the 71st uh, Communique, they have um, allowed hybrid projects to be, uh, to be licensed. So I think we will soon see a couple of, uh, let's say, trial investments to prove the, the concept. Um, there were so many questions. There was one more that I wanted to comment on, but I forgot the question. Yes. Waste, yes, waste. Um, waste to energy, I think the, there should be, I suggest strongly, a European uh, Union-led program with local municipalities in Turkey to teach and to support waste to energy. We have, as GE, worked very well with Istanbul municipality. We have installed up to now um, 16 megawatts of uh, waste to energy we generate, we use the waste and we generate electricity and give it back to the grid. There is so much to be done, but the regulations are rusty. They are not very really appealing and most of the municipalities, they change very really quickly every four years, every four years. They are not well educated and well aware of the situation from waste management to energy efficiency to, to many, many areas, a municipality can benefit a lot, but we need sort of like a European level program and maybe some contribution from banks like EBRD and TSKB to motivate these to, to happen. So we've worked on it, we have very good examples that prove a concept. We could even write a paper about it, but when you look at the rest of uh, Turkey, very limited. Starting with waste to energy. Uh, as EBRD, we're looking into waste to energy projects, but um, again, there are issues around the regulation because all the waste is handled and managed by the municipalities. And if you're to bring in private investors to invest in a waste to energy plan for 10, 15 years, then they need to have visibility on the waste supply. Now that means a, a very robust, very robust concession agreement with the municipalities, giving them a certainty, giving them the certainty on how much waste they, they will have access to and how that waste will be stored because the, the storage is handled by the municipality and it should be stored in a certain way for, for the investor to uh, take out the gas or, uh, uh, from, from the waste. So again, some serious regula regulatory issues to be addressed on the waste to energy side, but I agree it's a great potential, uh, especially for big cities in, in Turkey. Continuing with you know, EBRD financing of gas, that was in 2012. And as Gustav said, the way we approached it is, yes, we, the Turkey needs baseload power to um, accommodate the intermittent uh, you know, renewables um, and also to help the uh, retail market and uh, the merchant market make the market more transparent and more competitive because uh, CCGTs operate on their you know, cost base. So the, the more 
plants you have competing in the market uh, on a cost-based basis, then more, more competitive the market will become in the long run. So that's our, that was our motivation to finance uh, a CCGT back in 2012. Your question about conversion of coal to potentially gas and, and other technologies, no. Uh, and also we considered in the past whether we can do rehabilitation of coal plants. And for EBRD, we have um, in November uh, released our new energy sector strategy for the next five years. And coal is, you know, no touch. We cannot do anything uh, related to coal, including rehabilitation, conversion, uh, etc. Um, unfortunately, I mean, Turkey is going that way, but we as EBRD, being bound by uh, the Paris Agreement and also the climate change uh, approach, uh, we cannot touch coal. The question on solar, uh, at ZBRD, we, we believe there's a great potential in solar. Um, not much developed today because of the rather you know, interesting uh, regulation again, where the investors rushed into the unlicensed uh, type of investment, less than one megawatt, but it wasn't sustainable in the long run. And also for in, uh, financiers like EBRD, um, it, it was an interesting arrangement where investors were bundling a bunch of projects under one megawatt and making it like a portfolio of 20, 30 megawatts and then seeking financing for that, uh, which from our perspective didn't work. So we did not finance much of unlicensed, but we're now starting to finance the first round of licensed solar projects that were tendered out in 2015. And the big thing in solar will of course be the, the Yeka, 1,000 one megawatt Yeka, but that's yet to be seen. But one area of um, significant improvement that we foresee will be uh, rooftop solar and also distributed solar. Um, we, we are looking into that, uh, you know, how you know, corporations can have their own you know, solar investments to supply their own uh, facilities. Um, another question, any, any other questions? My question. Okay, your question on um, you know, Paris Agreement, whether that would impact EBRD's financing of, of Turkey. We appro the, our approach is we, we finance private sector. So if the private sector is, is to invest in renewables, we will probably go ahead and finance renewables, irrespective of, of, of the country's uh, approach to, to to climate change and also the Paris Agreement, but that doesn't mean that we turn a you know, blind eye on that. We, we con continue our dialogue with the, the, with the authorities to um, you know, align their uh, climate approach with the Paris Agreement. Uh, but as far as EBRD is concerned, we're, we will be following the, the Paris Agreement and also you know, staying away from coal. Uh, but my personal opinion is you know, based on the interactions we had with the government, uh, you know, their priority is to replace the imported energy with, with local resources. And that means, unfortunately, Turkey having um, limited options in, in gas and oil, uh, looking up to local coal. And the alternative to that is you know, to, to push forward the agenda on renewables, which I think it, it has a great potential, but um, in the short run, that's unfortunately the, the, the policy of the government to you know, um, support and increase the installed capacity in, in local coal. Yeah, the, the specific part of this discussion is, uh, it is said that after 2020, all the uh, investments or the funding for renewable energy will be called as climate finance. Mm -hmm. No. Because this is discussed also in mm -hmm. Katowice, etc. And then Turkey will not be eligible to get climate finance. I wasn't aware of that government position, to be honest, and it, it sounds quite controversial uh, because, you know, as far as EBRD is concerned, uh, our agenda is climate finance, and as, as long as we finance you know, renewables that support the climate, uh, you know, agenda, climate change agenda, uh, we should continue to, you know, continue financing renewables uh, in Turkey.
So I try to uh, reply one by one to the points that have been uh, <coughs> have been mentioned, uh, starting from uh, uh, the coal power plant. Uh, it is long time that EIB is not financing this kind of investments. We have not financed coal power plants, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, is more than 20 or 25 years, and in particular, no coal power plants in, in, uh, in Turkey. On the contrary, uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, we had some uh, assessment of uh, uh, gas fire, uh, fired power plants, uh, considering also uh, the gap of uh, um, electricity that was uh, an important gap for ensuring uh, a balanced development of Turkey. Uh, we decided uh, in 2011, so eight years ago, to provide uh, a long-term support uh, to uh, an European investors that was coming for the first time in Turkey. But uh, after 2011, we have not attached to any uh, gas-fired power plants. And we have seen that in the market, they had a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, similar projects uh, developed, uh, sometimes also with the contribution of international financing, because there was a real need in the country. Uh, gas uh, is, of course, uh, excluded uh, in general terms. And we have no doubt on that. But sometimes there are uh, uh, strategic considerations. And what uh, in Brussels they consider uh, energy security issues. When we have to deal with energy security issues, then uh, we can do some exceptions. Because there are geostrategic uh, situations where there is a need of diversification of resources of gas, and this is the case of TANAP. Uh, but apart from that, there are no other exemptions. Um, for uh, uh, the waste, uh, the uh, urban waste and the utilization of the urban waste for producing uh, electricity, this is a huge, uh, there is a huge potential, but has uh, uh, my colleague from EBRD just said uh, there is a, a rule, uh, a, let's say, a regular, regulatory problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, there is a long-term approach of the municipalities, on top of that probably on the government side, to give uh, the guidelines and to promote the development of these things. Unfortunately, in the last years, uh, the tendency was more to construct new uh, physical uh, infrastructures in terms of roads, railways, bridges, etc., and not look at the utilization of uh, uh, the urban waste uh, in, a, in a modern approach. But uh, is a, a huge market that sooner or later will develop also in Turkey. Uh, speaking about waste, I would say also we should look at uh, the energy waste we have in the buildings and uh, do an assessment on the public buildings, uh, on the schools, on the hospitals, in general on the public buildings. And if we do a, an energy efficiency assessment, we will see that the waste of energy we have in these buildings justify totally the investments and these investments will be uh, fully reimbursed, but the economy, uh, we will have uh, saving energy on the year-to-year -year basis. And we have example in other countries, uh, in Europe, especially in the northern countries, uh, where intervention of energy efficiency on public building has been extremely interesting in terms of long-term investment. Uh, solar, I fully agree with the comments of uh, Chanande just left. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, question marks for uh, long-term development of the solar uh, uh, investments, but uh, as EIB, as uh, soon as we have an opportunity, we take also solar investments, and I can mention to you 
the biggest solar plant we have financed in the desert near Wazazat in Morocco. This is one of the examples we show that also uh, solar is possible, but we should have the location that is the right location and uh, solving the kind of problem that have been uh, mentioned. Uh, Turkey and Paris Agreement. To be frank, I have no doubt on the interest that Turkey has to fulfill uh, the Paris Agreement. There is no, let's say, reasons. Uh, um, the reason you mentioned, to be frank with you, I really don't understand why Turkey we will get less resources uh, if uh, they agree and they full uh, uh, sign the Paris Agreement. On the contrary, I would say, in the relation with, with the European Union, uh, not uh, uh, fulfilling the conditions of uh, uh, the Paris Agreement will be uh, more a problem than a solution. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. For the solar, uh, I would say, uh, nobody mentioned, but uh, if you are uh, financing an unlicensed solar, which is the 99% of Turkey, you don't know what's going to happen after Yektem. Uh, are they going to be able to sell electricity? We don't know yet. So uh, that's another issue on the investment side, I would say. Uh, for hybrid, uh, I think it was two months ago, uh, the government announced a project or announced a regulatory thing that hydroelectric power plants with large reservoirs areas can uh, use another source of electricity uh, for internal use, which means that if you have a large reservoir area, you can build a small solar power plant on, on the top of your reservoir area, which brings a hybrid issue. Solar, wind, energy storage, that will be the future of, uh, I would say, it's my personal opinion, that could be the future of uh, electricity sector in Turkey if we want to uh, be aligned with Paris Agreement and COP. Uh, for waste energy, uh, I believe uh, Turkey is buying waste from England, and Norway is Norway is exporting waste. So, if we solve the regulatory problems, waste is uh, even though now nowadays it's more expensive than solar, uh, solar and uh, wind, but it could be a good uh, opportunity to uh, have an electricity security or energy security in Turkey. Uh, for COP, I would mention uh, Fatih Birol, the I IEA president. He was talking about if we stop, uh, if we stop financing anything which gives you uh, carbon emission, we cannot even end up with 1.5 degrees at the end of 2030, if we stop everything right now. So it's difficult in Turkey's situation. Uh, the government has, I mean, has discussed to be on the developing side, not the develop side. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna be able to do it, but they are trying, I believe. Uh, we will see what's gonna happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone who didn't get the answer About legal points connected with uh, pollution. In Turkey, for example, in Istanbul, do you have any penalties for waste from the cars, for example? Do you have any ideas? Do we need reformation in this sector? Penalties about what kind of pollution? Car, Cars. from the car, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, clear answer to your question. Um, in Istanbul, uh, the traffic is what we know. Uh, there is again a long-term approach. Uh, try to eliminate cars and uh, substitute the cars, and in particular the individual cars, with public transport. But this is a, a transport long-term strategy 
that needs to be implemented. Istanbul has done uh, huge efforts to invest in public transport. And you have seen that in the last 10, 15 years, the metro network has grown and will continue to grow. This is the measure we are supporting to reduce the traffic. But unfortunately, as the population is growing, also the number of cars are growing. Uh, so uh, we had several occasions to discuss with the Istanbul municipality how we can improve the situation. And they have started to introduce some small measures. You have seen that uh, there is a possibility to go by bike in certain parts of the cities. But it is also a way uh, we should educate the people not to use the car and having something that could substitute the car for uh, the small, uh, uh, let's say, uh, transfers from one part to another uh, in Istanbul. There is no answer to your question. Unfortunately, it is only a long-term strategy that could, uh, uh, again, give us the possibility to improve the situation. As far as I know, no penalties on gas be emitted by, through, by the cars, but every two years, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to go through checks um, to see how much the, your car is emitting, and it should be below a certain uh, threshold uh, for the car to be given the you know, uh, right to go in traffic. But it, it's more of a matter of congestion, as um, my colleague from EIB highlighted. You know, that's the issue that needs to be tackled. I mean, even if, the, the, if you reduce, go with the you know, high-tech cars with the lowest emissions, as, as long as the congestion is there, it, it is still an issue. And also, there is no penalty, but there can be an incentive if you uh, are driving less emissive car, but uh, there is no such a tax uh, difference. difference. of time, so if you have a few more questions, we can <coughs> continue. We have two more questions. Okay, so th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joe from a Chinese think tank. So I think the author's story at the paper is very interesting. Uh, I don't know whether you study Chinese case, Chinese experience about wind power. So it's a very interesting because 10 years ago, uh, wind power, solar power, nuclear power, uh, a very popular uh, topic in China. Uh, but today, uh, after 10 years, uh, wind power in China, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disaster, I have to say. Because, you know, in the very beginning, in 2008, uh, when Chinese government signed the uh, Paris Treaty, um, government gave lots of money to the private company uh, for booming this, uh, this industry. But the pro um, I think at least uh, three pro problems happened in China. The first is the uh, China, uh, China National Grid is a state-owned company. They dominate the, all the network, the grid of the country. So they don't allow the private companies uh, uh, power electricity uh, capacity connect with the national grid. This is the uh, one problem. The second problem, you know, five years ago, uh, China uh, real estate market is, was booming. So the land become very, very expensive. So you know the wind power plant is huge. <laughs> the size is very huge. So the local government, they, uh, they were comparing uh, their benefits from the, from the power and from the real estate market. So you can see the shortage and the problem here. So I think today, Chinese local government they just refuse uh, developing more wind power plants in their land. And uh, the third problem is the cost. 
uh, I know your topic is very interesting about cost. The cost in China is a, is a very strange and a very, uh, very unique uh, question for, for wind power uh, capacity. You know, uh, one, uh, one kW, uh, kilowatt, I think, in China is a 0 0.25 IMB. But from the fossil fuel uh, power station and the power industry, uh, it, oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, from wind power is uh, 0 0.50. And uh, from wind, uh, from a, you know, fossil fuel is uh, uh, 0 0.25. So you, you can see the price is double. So, uh, so I think it's a waste uh, lot of money uh, in this industry. Uh, so, uh, but I, I'm very glad to hear uh, your insights about the Turkey, uh, Turkey market. Maybe it's very different. Thank you. Hello again. It's me, Kovanc Gorkem from Trans Pacific Energy. Uh, I want to make a remark and like to know if you approve or not. Regarding the Paris Agreement, I think Turkey's main concern is protecting its cement industry and steel industry. Would you agree that? Okay. Is there any other questions? Okay. Maybe we can proceed. Very interesting to hear about the situation in China. I mean, I think the in some regards, it mirrors the situation in other European countries um, that, you know, it's not without challenges that one develops a, a wind power sector. And I mean, the, the last point that you highlighted that the cost has been a big uh, barrier, I mean, that's what we see in, in Europe as well. Um, for instance, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge difference having a 3% cost of capital as opposed to 13%, which is Germany versus Greece becomes a lot more expensive to, to expand that sector than if you have a 10 percentage point difference. Um, I don't know what the cost of capital is in China. Maybe we can talk later um, after the session, because it would be very interesting to hear what it is, if there have been any studies that have, that have been done on it. I mean, one interesting aspect to consider is what will happen to the technology cost as deployment increases. So if you look at solar PV prices over time, they've gone down like this. Really. And we see the same thing with electric vehicles, that battery costs are falling very rapidly. So that offers you know, some sense of optimism for the future. You know, as more countries add wind power, hopefully technology costs will, will go down as well. Paris since 2015. Uh, 
So we are discussing this topic uh, all, all the time with the uh, Minister of Environment, uh, Minister of Finance, etc. And this is this is the main reason why Turkey is too shy about uh, the climate politics. We we also communicated several times uh, these messages. And uh, as a conclusion, at least uh, from my side, uh, one other important message for the development of a renewable energy market in the country is to review the legislation and uh, regulation on local content. Because local content, like it is uh, foreseen in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, decisions of the government, uh, let's look at the last uh, couple of years, is uh, simply not affordable. This is uh, a major obstacle to get long-term financing from international institutions. Uh, is a part of the regulation. Or you are adopting a regulation that is in line with international standards, or you have the Turkish standards and the actual Turkish standards are simply not eligible for international financing. Uh, if you have last remarks, then uh, you can... And then Just to add on, add on the point on local content. Again, as being a European, let's say, funded bank, we're also having um, issues on the local content. Um, I mean, we do appreciate the government's strategy and agenda to um, improve the manufacturing uh, sector in, in terms of renewable technology. But uh, they, based on our experience in, in uh, our countries of operations, premiums, you know, local content premiums are not the way to go on, on this. And there are other ways to support the, the manufacturing side of it. Um, that as uh, my colleague from EIB said, you know, it is, it is a key, key issue uh, for more long-term financing from international banks coming into Turkey. Do you have any more? So uh, the last, my last question, maybe we can finish with you, Usta, uh, that uh, what I understood from your presentation that your main message that if you, if Turkey uh, stops Yekta, then it can be more harmful to the future wind investments. So what is your proposal uh, after 2020? Uh, so I mean, Yektem will stop after 2020. Um, so th the, the message we were trying to convey is that you need to maintain renewable support. You know, if that comes through another scheme, that's that's good, uh, but Yektem in itself will, um, will not uh, continue. And I mean, I, th I think you can look at it, you know, up till 2020, uh, there might be a temptation to reduce feed and tariff schemes given the increased cost of the overall uh, Yektem scheme. Uh, but we've seen in other countries that that could have some very bad consequences for future investment. So in that regard, you know, in the coming two years, uh, or one, two years, uh, it is important to, to maintain the, the feed-in tariff rates that are, that are currently set. I mean, a, a, a big, a big uh, or an important factor is, you know, just providing uh, certainty. Um, Post-2020, it's important that investors know what price they can expect to be selling at. Because if you have a lot of price fluctuations in their output price, then, you know, that, that creates more risk for investors. So it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to come up with, you know, um, solid recommendations for how Turkey should develop the, the wind power sector after 2020, but that would be one, one aspect that I would highlight, that you just want to provide a, a stable investment environment. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Thank you for your time.